take your Bibles and be turning with me to Judges chapter 7. We're going to talk a little bit about Gideon today. In case you didn't grasp that from me telling the kids that we're going to talk about Gideon. We're going to talk a little bit about Gideon. And I want us to look at the life of Gideon and some of the things that went on. And so, as you're finding uh, Judges chapter 7, I'll review for you where we are. The Israelites at this point in history are being oppressed by the Midianites. Now, who are the Midianites? Well, they're people that aren't Israelites that are oppressing the Israelites. They live in Midian. Now, where is Midian? We don't exactly know. If you would like to stir up some Bible geographer debates, uh, most people put Midian somewhere in the Arabian Peninsula. Some people put it on the Sinai Peninsula. Some people put it in other places. Probably the Arabian Peninsula, if you really want to get there. But these are the people, actually they're distant cousins of Moses' father-in-law. So again, we have people that are related, but they do not agree with the people of Israel. And why have we gotten here? Because once again, after the life of Deborah, after 40 years, the people of Israel again did evil in the sight of God. If you think, for example, that seeing the 18th government shutdown in the past 36 years is unique, if, if you think this is unique, it's not. It, it's not. People get in a cycle where they do what's right, and then they forget to do what's right, and they do what's wrong. And then they cause all sorts of problems by doing so. And then finally they get those straightened out, and they do what's right. And you think, okay, well now we'll just do what's right from here on out. But then we don't. The people of Israel did the same thing. This is why history so often, although it, you know, it, it feels, you know, it seems kind of wrong, but if you go take a history book off the shelf in my office, and if you want to know which one's the history books, just grab four. One of, four books at random, one of them will be a history book, I'm almost certain. But if you, if you take a history book and look at the history of our country or the history of the world, it seems like things go along, there's a war. The war ends, things go up, there's another. You'd think we'd learn to get along, but we don't. This is because while Adam and Eve were created perfect in the Garden of Eden, they were created perfect and given a free will, and they choose to bring sin into this world. And that means that from then on out, all of us are born with a bent to sinning. Every last one of us. No matter how nice of a person somebody grows up to be, they're still born with a bent to sinning. They're still born with a tendency to take and look at what God has said and turn it aside and do what they want to do instead. Grandparents, it's the hardest thing in the world for y'all to believe, I know. Because you cannot look at your grandbaby and say, that there will ever be anything wrong with this child? I know that that's hard for you to acknowledge. Parents don't have a problem with this. Grandparents have the biggest, part of, biggest problem with believing that we're all born with a tendency to sin. Because grandchildren are perfect. I know, I have heard this. I have heard this time and again. I've heard it for 12 years. Ever since I became custodian of, some, of my father's grandchild and became responsible for her. I've heard this, but we all have this tendency. Some people it shows up in different ways. We all have this tendency. The people of Israel are just like us. For a while they do good and they do right. First because they want to, then because they feel like they have to, then because there's a benefit, and then they decide, oh, we'll just do it our own way anyway. And in the book of Judges, we see the cycle over and over again where they take and they've gone away from what is good and they've gone so far into what is bad that instead of God simply sending them His Word as a reminder through a prophet, through a judge, through a teacher who says, we need to turn back to right, instead He brings foreign oppression on them. He brings someone from the outside to oppress them and cause them difficulty to remind them of what they're supposed to be focused on. And if, as you start clicking through the news and through your social media, 
sites and everything else in, 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 that, that you get involved with on a day-to-day -day basis and you start to see various things and you say, well, this sounds like people are deliberately being mean to Christians. First of all, you're probably right. If you go to Egypt today, there are people that go out and are deliberately mean to Christians to the point of death. If you go to Syria, you'll find that people in Syria are deliberately mean to believers in Christ to the point of death. In China, they're deliberately mean to the point of imprisonment. And in various places in the United States, they're deliberately mean to the point of inconvenience. Because there are times that it's inconvenient for us as believers. And we get annoyed with this, but we need to realize that we have yet to see the persecution of Christians in the United States. I think it's coming. When you threaten a priest with, that you're going to throw him in prison if he shows up today to celebrate the Mass, celebrate Mass with his congregation, which has been threatened to about 300 Catholic priests in the United States today that serve the United States military, then you're starting to go in that direction. We're not there yet, but we're starting. You're starting to get there. When you start to see places like uh, cities and, and places that don't have churches and that where it's expensive to build, you'll have churches that want to get started. And so what will they do? Well, they will rent, because it's publicly available to rent, they'll rent a school cafeteria to have a church meeting in on Sunday. It's a great plan. It brings money into the school system. Nobody's using the school on Sunday. But there have been some cities and some school districts that will rent their cafeterias, they'll rent their, their facilities to anybody. You want to have a country western dance party on Sunday, as long as you clean up after yourself, they'll rent it to you. You can do whatever you want to do, but the one group they'll turn down are Christians. You can't have a church. Folks, outside oppression like that ought to drive us to make sure that we are actually focused on Christ. That's why he allows it. Is to drive us to our knees in prayer and drive us to be more like him. The oppression that the Midianites bring on the people of Israel in this time is to drive them to their knees in prayer, to drive them to come back to God where they should have been in the first place. Folks, darkness is, is growing in the world around us, and it's not growing because light is weaker than darkness. It's growing because so many times the light that God has put in churches deliberately covers itself with a bucket and goes home. And we need to be careful about that. But that's what's going on. The Midianites are oppressing the people of Israel. God sends someone to visit Gideon, we're going to talk about Gideon and his encounter with God tonight, but he sends someone who commissions Gideon and says, raise up an army. We're going to get rid of these Midianites. No more Midianites. Now the Bible describes the Midianites as having so many they couldn't be counted. There's lots of them. We don't really know how many that is. Uh, you know, if we just get one of those, you know, oh, there's lots and lots and lots uh, type, of, type of images. Gideon raises up an army of 22,000 people. Now realize this, if 22,000 can be counted, so many that can't be counted, there's got to be a lot more. Okay, Scripture has no difficulty counting hundreds of thousands, so a lot more is a pretty substantial amount. The people of Israel have a small force to face off against this giant enemy. And most of you have been in church long enough that you've heard of how God says, eh, 22,000 is still too big of an army, let's cut it down. And he says, if you're scared, go home. And then he says, let's cut it down even more, and cuts down to 300. And he sends those 300 out in battle. Now as we look at this, we need to understand how the people of Israel are facing this. They're scared. They're terrified. There is a threat to their way of life. There is a threat to them. Personal. So 
something we need to understand is that so often the threat is really more against us personally than it is against you know, the gospel. Folks, Jesus said that the gates of hell would not prevail against this church. The gospel and the message of the truth of the cross will never go away. It's a question of what happens to us and our involvement. But God calls out the faithful who are willing to stand and to fight. And at the end of the day, there's 300 of them. Those who are too scared to go home. Now that does not mean that the 300 that end up remaining weren't scared. It just means that even if they were a little bit scared, they were still willing to stand. They were still willing to put their faith and their trust in God as they went into battle. We often try to turn this into a great hero story that these are the 300 most valiant warriors. These are the, the, you know, the, the, the Marines of, of Israel. These are the Navy SEALs or, or you know, special ops. You know, these are your Green Berets, but they're probably not. These are 300 ordinary guys who were able to, at the very least, take their fear and restrain it to the point to stand. Up against a horde, a whole lot more than anybody thought they could defeat. Folks, there are never as many faithful people as you'd like to have. Oh, it would be nice if we had this many people to go out and do this. If we had, you know, if we only had 500 prayer warriors, if we only had, you know, five extra missionaries, if we only had an extra preacher, if we only had more Sunday school teachers, more children's teachers, folks, there are never as many people who are willing to be faithful to what God has called us to do as we'd like, like there to be. There will never be as many people willing to stand up and be counted as someone who will follow Christ as you would like there to be. Say, oh, there's got to be, you know, at my workplace, there's, out of the 20 of us, 18 of us always talk about going to church. Surely if it came down to standing for Christ in the workplace, you know, out of those 18, all of us would stand up for that, and you find that only four do. Of all the parents and the kids that are involved in this activity, we all, we all know each other from church. Surely if this activity takes a direction away from something that's God-honoring, we take a stand and turn it back, and then you find that there's not as many people interested in that as you thought there would be. Well, surely we've elected enough people who claim that they're Christians to, to the legislature or to the Congress or as president or as governor. Surely they'll take a stand and do that, that which is right for us. But then when you look for those who are willing to stand and be faithful, you find you don't need as big of a meeting room as you thought you did. Surely we all come to church together and we all worship together and we've been through so much together. Surely we'd be willing to stand. And yet then we find when it, put, when it comes down to it, when push comes to shove, as they say, We find that we don't need the giant bus to transport the faithful. It can be done in a minivan. That's where Gideon finds himself, and he's got 300. But then we see how they fight. They take those 300. And they divide them. And this is where we are in Judges chapter 7, beginning with verse 19. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. This is basically the middle of the night. Okay? You divide the night. The Jews divided the night roughly into three watches, about four hours apiece. So this is about four hours after sundown. Basically what you've got is... Two-thirds of the people of the Midianites have been in bed for about four hours. A third of them have been up for the last four hours, but they've had a full day, and they've been up, so they're kind of tired, ready to go to bed, and you've got a third of them starting to wake up thinking, oh, we have to go on duty and watch. 
Now, if you've ever had to try to wake up in the middle of the night to get something done, you know it takes a couple of minutes. And keep in mind, this is before the discovery of that amazing little bean that you could press hot water through. Okay, nobody's got coffee. So it takes even longer to get them waking up. Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outskirts of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. When they had just posted the watch, and they blew the trumpets. They had trumpets... And they broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing and cried a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. What they had done is they had surrounded the people in three groups. They had taken torches and covered them with clay pitchers. And they had a trumpet and a torch. Now if I were to tell you that tomorrow you're going to go into battle... And here's what I want you to take. A harmonica and a flashlight. You would say, I really don't think I'd like to go into battle following someone whose instructions are get yourself a harmonica and a flashlight. Even if I told you to get a trumpet and a flashlight, you'd be, I don't think that's... We're going into battle. At the very least, shouldn't we take a handgun and a bow and arrow? But they've gone into battle and they've got a, flat, a torch in one hand and a trumpet in the other. And you know what that means? They don't have a hand to draw a sword. They don't have anything with which to actually fight. It's a bizarre plan. It's the plan that God has given them, though. This is what God has said. And they shout out, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Of course, they shout it in Hebrew, and we won't do that in here because I'd get wrong and you wouldn't know. But they call out, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And this wakes up everybody in the Midianite camp. And God strikes them with such a confusion that they destroy themselves. Each stood in his place around the camp, and all the army ran, crying out as they fled. When they blew 300 trumpets, the Lord sent the sword of one against another, even throughout the whole army. And the army fled as far as Beth Shittah, towards Ararat, as far as the edge of Abel Malah, by Tabith. The men of Israel were then summoned from Naphtali and Asher, and all Manasseh, and they pursued Midian. But they set the sword against themselves. They destroyed the Midianites, fought, and destroyed themselves. Because 300 took their clay pitchers and their trumpets and had faith enough to fight. Now we come in our lives to a couple of things to think about. First of all, where is your faith? The people of Israel at this point, this army is gathered God's command is this. Smash the pictures and shine the light. Jesus told us that we are the light of the world. He also consistently taught that He is the light that shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome. But we build so much around that light. We build our own plans, our own intentions, our own desires. And we say, well, we want to honor God, but we also want to have this. We want to honor God, but we want to make sure that, that, that all of our good churchy traditions are followed. We want to honor God, but we also want to make sure we keep living in nice houses. We want to honor God, but we don't want to make anybody upset. We want to honor God, but we want to live the way we want all at the same time. And every, every aspect of that is like taking a picture and putting it over the top of the torch that God has given us. And the call to each and every one of us in this time is to look at our life and look at the picture that we have taken and put over the top of the torch of the light that God has given us and make this decision. Are we willing to smash those jars and let our light shine? Many of us 
those look at our jars and say, but it's such a pretty jar. I've had this for so long. I began to make this be this beautiful clay jar way back in kindergarten. That first time they brought the potter's wheel and we learned to throw mud on it and spread it out. And I began to make this and I've had it for so long. In fact, people know me by my jar. They know by this stripe that, I, that I'm a person that does this. And they know by, by this scar here what bad thing I went through ten years ago. They know from this crack over here the, the problem that I had. And, and then there's this hole that was drilled in years ago. And people know me by my jar. People recognize my jar. People, you know, treat me special because of the way my jar looks, because of what I've went through, what I've gone through. Or people treat me special because they look at the fancy paint on the jar that covers all those, those scars. They see the way that I cover it up and they see the way I, I'm always happy and I'm always joyful and I'm always at least faking it. Because nobody sees the, the roughed up parts on the inside. And we know each other by our jars. We want to be seen for that. Well, I was this and I was that. Or we say, well, I think my jar is too stuck to my light. It melted on there when that last relationship failed. A jar, my, my jar melted onto my torch when my kids turned and did something that I, I disagreed with. Or, you know, this happened, and you know, and way back in my college years, there were things I did that, that basically stuck my jar to my torch, and I don't think I can do anything about it. I want to be just known. I'm known by my jar. But I want to tell you something. Standing for God in the midst of the darkness. Standing for God in the midst of the world around us to do what is right requires us to be willing to look at that jar and break it. Requires us to be willing to look at it and say, instead of my identity being my clay pot, my identity will be the light that shines through. And the shards of clay that I will leave at my feet will not be what defines me anymore. I will not be defined as the person who had to, who, who wrestled with this addiction. I will not be defined as the person who was the winner of this contest. I will not be defined as, as this or as that by the trophies on my wall, by the certificates in my file, by the record that comes up if you run me through the, through the National Instant Check System. I will not be defined by these things anymore. I will be defined by the light that I shine for God. And I am willing to take my credit report and smash it on the ground. I am willing to take my beautiful investment portfolio and smash it and leave it on the ground and let the only thing that remains of me be the light that I shine. Do we have faith enough that if we stand for God and do nothing but stand and shine our light, that He'll take care of it. Do we have faith enough that if we come together as God's people, as a church, and say, we're going to smash these. And I really wanted to bring in like a stack of clay jars and just make this a loud, demonstrative sermon, but I didn't want to clean up the mess. It's a mental picture. We're going to take this clay pot that we have put over ourselves and say, well, this is what we are. Smash it. And call out the one thing that matters to us, the sword of the Lord. You say, oh, okay, so are we going to get swords? You ought to already have one. 
For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. As much as you might not like that person down the street that you'd like to go struggle with, as much as you might want to load up and let's go to Washington, D.C. and struggle with flesh and blood and fix those problems, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and principalities, the evil forces of this world. And when we run through that entire list of things that Paul reminds us that is the armor of every one of us as we go into battle, the thing that should stand out to you is that there is a sword there. And it's the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. It is by the Word of God that confusion struck the Midianites. It is by the Word of God that this truth is proclaimed in this world. It is by the Word of God that we stand and fight. And that is what, when we shine our light, that we speak forth and shout forth into this world however we can. Clearly, definitely, and to the people that need to hear it. Which starts with every one of us and goes out into the whole universe. Everybody needs to hear that which is the Word of God as we shine forth the light of Him. The sword of the Lord. It's not to go out and be violent among people, but it is to go out and proclaim God's truth. That there is a God. That you're not Him, but that He loves you. That Jesus died for your sins, but He didn't stay dead. He rose up from the grave on the third day and ascended after 40 days where He sat down at the right hand of God the Father and all power and authority is in Him. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And you can either accept that and do that now under with, with all of the joy and gladness that comes with the release of your sins, or you can wait and do it later with all the regret and pain and heartbreak that comes with acknowledging that you've been wrong and that there's nothing you can do about it. The sword of the Lord, which is the Word of God, that reminds us that we are to go and share the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the things that ought to be the focus of our life that we ought to be seeking to see produced in the way that we live as we shine our light on people around us. That we're to build up treasures for ourselves, not on this earth. If you, if you were to show your treasure, if you would start with a bank statement, then you're building treasure in the wrong place. Your treasure ought to be built up in heaven where nothing can destroy it. It starts with this, as followers of Christ, as the firm faithful who are willing to walk with Him. Are you willing to stand in the midst of the darkness and break your jaw? And be known more as a follower of Christ than as anything else. He said, it sounds like I, I, I would lose my identity. Nobody would know who I am. Well, I will point you to this. Everybody also had a trumpet. Now, I was a saxophone player, and so I, I kind of, you know, haven't always had a great deal of respect for anybody that played a brass instrument, although trombone folks are okay. I would have rather the scripture recorded that everybody had a saxophone, but they hadn't been invented at the time. Everybody had a trumpet. And said so that they blew their trumpets and they shouted out. The scripture doesn't record for us what tune, what tune they blew. And I think it's because of this. You had 300 people with 300 trumpets, and just like you would get if you had 300 trumpet players in this room and told them all to play, you had 300 different loud trumpet hit melodies. That each one showed a difference in the, in the personality and in the style of everybody who played it. I've been in a room with 30 trumpet players, and they play all 30 of them play differently. I can't imagine 300. How you play your trumpet is how you show who you are. That is how you point people that sound clearly what God has done for you. That is how you reflect who you are. But it is in pointing people to what's the point of the trumpet? To get folks to look up and see the light. Folks, we're not different because we have different jars that, that we want to be known by that mask the light. Where we show our differences is in the way that we draw people to that light. 
It's in the trumpet melodies that we play. It's in the ways in which we express our joy, our gladness, our following of Christ, and our willingness to be known. And our willingness to stand and be exposed. Because you're talking in the middle 